Well, thank you guys for your obedience in that. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just thank you for this day. I thank you for each person that's here and each person watching, Lord. Lord, I ask that you allow me to deliver your message so that each person here is a different person when they walk out those doors because of your love and your grace. I love you, Lord. praise you, and I look forward to being your servant on this day at this time and this moment. In Jesus' precious and holy name, amen, amen, and amen. Uh, we're going to be in the book of Acts chapter 10. You can look that up in a minute, and, and, but I'm going to get started with something else, and then I'll tell you when we're going to get into it. But while I'm talking about it, I'm going to give you a brief summary. Up until this point, a lot's been happening in the book of Acts, and those of you guys that, first of all, if there's any visitors here that don't know me, because we've had a lot of visitors every week, my name is Brad, and I'm one of the pastors here, and uh, thank you. And uh, as you know, this church is multi-talented. Because beginning to worship, our senior pastor, Pastor Scott, boy, he can play that guitar and sing, can he? And I bet some of you guys thought all he could do was, was just preach, huh? But, yeah, he preaches good, too, but, yeah. And then if you notice our worship pastor, who's usually up here singing, was bound out on the drums. If you was looking up, man, he's tearing those drums up. But that guy, John, is so multi-talented, he plays every instrument across here. So I just thought I'd give him some props just because of the fact that he did a good job. And one other thing, you got to believe that God would use anybody anywhere at any time. Because I don't know about you, but when Santa Claus came up here, <laughs> Randy, Randy came up here. I've known Randy for many, many years. And Randy is a phenomenal teacher of the word of God. But Randy's one of those guys that likes to teach behind doors. But when our pastor Scott says, no, we think we're going to put you up on stage all I know is Randy was going, but his knees was knocking hard. Well, Wednesday night, he delivered the message. Today, he delivered the message. I can go home now, right? <laughs> I just want to give these guys props because, you know, God works in us if we're willing to just open up our hearts and allow him to use us the way he's, he's designed to use us and not because of the way we want to be used. Amen? Amen. And it's hard. But up until right now, we have a guy by the name of Peter that I'm going to talk about. Just done some talking, and I'm going to talk a little bit about him. But, but last week, one of our other pastors, Robert, laid out a little bit of Peter's journey. But one of Peter's journeys was that he still had this Jewish mentality that the Jews and the Gentiles aren't supposed to be mixing. Well, God just decided, I'm going to throw a boomerang on that and let you, let you know that you're all my children. And I love you the same. So, yeah, I want you to go down. I want you to go in and I want you to talk to these people. And I want you to speak. And when, I, when we started in this chapter that we're in, you might not realize it, but that is the very first time that one of the apostles ever preached to the Gentiles. You're like, what you talking about, pastor? Jesus was talking to them all the time. I said one of the apostles. I didn't say Jesus. Jesus was talking to the Jewish people, trying to get their heads straight, get their hearts right, get them out of the clouds, thinking that they're so high and mighty and better than everybody else to do whatever they needed to do, that there are other people in this world that God had created that need to hear his word, and it needs to get out, and I'm going to use my apostles to do it. And Peter just happened to be the one to do the first sermon to those apostles. We're going to learn a little bit about that. But before I even get into my sermon, I want to share something with you guys. About a week and a couple weeks ago, my wife and I had the privilege of going to Williamsport, Pennsylvania to watch the Little League World Series. I even have on my, I, I got my own little, uh, little souvenir I bought for myself, so I thought I'd show it off today. But I'm going to tell you how awesome it is with God. I have a brother in Christ that I've known for so many years who has probably been an example of what an awesome Little League world, Little League coach is. I watched him raise all of his boys. I watched him take care of these kids, be a good example to these kids, teach these kids the game, and they looked up at him. And I thought of him often because the talent that is in Williamsport is off the chart. I mean, most of these kids can go to the local high school and beat the local high school. Trust me, they're that good. But I have a brother here today that walked in these doors and I didn't expect to see him. I didn't invite him, but he's here. That just warms my heart because he's a visitor to, to us today, first time visiting. 
And it wasn't me that invited him, but his daughter. And I love him. I'll always love him. And I just want to let him know that I appreciate you for the lessons that I've learned over the years and how what sportsmanship is all about when it comes to baseball. Why do I say all of that? Because when we were in Williamsport, they, if you don't know, the Little League World Series, they have kids that are 10, 11, and 12 years old playing their hearts out for baseball. Why did I go? Because it's a bucket list, but most of all, those kids play with heart. They give everything they have to the game. But my only experience with Little League was in the local area, and all I ever hear was parents berating the referees, parents berating their kids, parents berating the coaches, everybody up there screaming and yelling and cussing and fussing because they're, they're not willing to put themselves in that spotlight and raise those kids the way they need to be seen. What an example needs to be, not raise them, but see so they can have an example. But let me tell you what happened in Williamsport. They, they have a huge complex there. I never felt like I was in a place with so many people from all around the world that came together and united in one as ever before, especially in a time when you turn on the TV and all you see is war all over the place. Some of these kids came from war zones. You know, you got kids from the Czech Republic. You got kids, well, let me just tell you something. There was, to get to the World Series, it's a hard journey. But once they get there, you got kids in the United States from Illinois, New York, Pennsylvania, South Dakota, Nevada, New Hampshire, Washington, Florida, Texas, and Hawaii. Those are the two ten teams that have represented the U.S. Internationally, you got Chinese Taipei, Australia, Canada, Aruba, Cuba, Czech Republic, Japan, Venezuela, Mexico, and Puerto Rico. What they do is they take these kids and they put them in dormitories and they make them all live together. Now we, as adults, learn from those kids how to get along. You would never know that there's that many nationalities. That You didn't never know that there's kids that are probably come from million-dollar families sleeping next to a kid who sleeps on a dirt floor when he's not there. You would never know there's an economic difference. You would never know that they don't even speak the same language, but, boy, they play together all day long for two weeks but that's not it. That's not the end of it. These kids, all of them have parents. The stands is full of parents. And guess what? In a political year where we can't even stand each other sometimes, Christians can't even stand each other sometimes because of political craziness, you're in a stadium where people have no clue what's going on with any of you guys, and we're all like family. They watch your stuff. When I was acting like a knucklehead up on the hill sliding and my wife was watching all our stuff in the stands, some people turned to her and says, how come you're not up there with them? She goes, I got to watch my stuff. They go, we'll watch it for you. And they did. They didn't go rifling through her purse and try to find out what's there. They protected what was there. They didn't know us from the man on the moon. Little did they know who I was. They probably thought if they knew me, they'd probably say, oh, no, we're going to get you out of here. We don't want him around. That's what I'd probably said anyway. My whole point being is God was in that place. God did a miraculous thing. We went with another family that we, we've known for years back in our previous church, and they moved to Texas, and their name is Bill and Violet Pressler, and we were all four of us were there. And I'm going to tell you what happened. One day, it was early in the week. The championship is actually on Sunday, but I think it was Thursday of that week. We were walking around in the, in the, in the area where all the concession and all that stuff is, and all of a sudden, you start, you start seeing people, groups of people praying here and praying there. And there was a group of people over in the corner, about four of them, that were praying. And Violet, who was with us, decided, wow, this is neat. I'm going to take a picture because they don't care who's seeing them, what's going on. They're not ashamed of the gospel. They're in the middle of everybody walking around, and they're, in, they're huddled together praying. So she takes a picture of it. So then on Sunday... The championship comes around. Now, after going through all of this, you had Florida versus Chinese Taipei. Chinese, Chinese Taipei is one of these teams that, like, wins the World Series every other year. They're like robots. These kids are just phenomenal. They're professional-looking players. And Florida had already gotten beat by Texas, 
So now they had to work their way up through the loser's bracket. Chinese Taipei, nobody touched them with a 10-foot pole. Well, the game starts. Chinese Taipei is winning. They only play six innings. Florida's the home team, bottom of the sixth. Florida hasn't, able to, hasn't, hasn't been able to get past second base. And they're down 1-0. The coach for Florida pulls his team in for a rally, rally message. Got to get these guys up. Their, head, their, their shoulders are down like this, realizing it's three outs and we're done. Our hopes for winning the World Series is over. And the coach pulled them aside in the dugout before they went out to bat. They're down 1-0. And he says this. Before I tell you what he says, uh, if I can get my uh, tech crew, can you put this picture up on the, on, the, on the big screen for me, please? You see that picture behind me? That's the Florida coach with a few more people, and they're praying. That, remember that picture I told you Violet took? It was that on Thursday. Now we're on Sunday. The coach of Florida's team was inside the dugout, you heard of ESPN. It's a worldwide TV network. They play, showed all the games. Coaches have microphones on them, and they don't know if they're turned on or turned off. ESPN controls that. So what happened was is ESPN decided they're going to zero in on the coach in the dugout. Now it's been simulcast worldwide, and he tells his players this because he's trying to get them up. Their shoulders are down, and they're getting ready to lose the World Series. He says, I want to tell you guys something. There was a early this week, and this is the coach speaking. He goes, early this week, a man came down to my father and I and says, I don't want to pray with for you guys and pray with you guys. And he commenced to praying. Then he told him, he goes, but I want to tell you this also. God told me to come down here and talk to you guys, and God told me to tell you this. You're the world champions. Florida is winning and will win the World Series. Not only that, God told me to tell you that it's written in the book. Now, when I hear the book, I'm thinking now the book of life, and I'm thinking, come on now, this is some prophetic words being said. But God said, you have won already. It's written in the book. Enjoy yourself. And the coach is now telling his players on national TV that, come on, guys, you've won already. God has already ordained us to win. God has written it in his book. All you have to do, boys, is just go out and have fun. Do what you've been practicing for. Do what I ask you to do. Be yourselves and play baseball. Don't worry about trying to knock it out of the park or do anything great. Just go have fun and play ball because it is written. It is done. We have already won this World Series. The kid, first kid goes up the bat. I don't even remember what happened. I don't remember if he struck out or what. It was out. Next kid comes up the bat. It was out. And if you know anything about baseball, they're getting to the back of their lineup. We all know that the power and the strength is in the, fr in the front of the lineup. It gets a little weak towards the end. They're getting to the middle back. They end up getting a couple hits. They score a run, and they tie the game. Now they have to go in extra innings. Little League rule is after the first extra inning, which they went into extra inning. Taipei didn't do any good. Chinese didn't do any good. They didn't do it. That inning ended. Tie game. When they go into the next inning, they always put a runner on second base and then have a, have a batter with two outs. That way it makes it easier to score. So that's the rule of Little League. Well, Florida, Chinese Tap Chinese Tap A comes up. Florida shut them down. Now Florida has a runner on second base. And out comes this kid about this tall. The bat is about that tall. And he walks out there, and you can hear the commentators, and I know, I'm like, this kid, I've watched this kid play the whole game. He struck out every single time. He didn't even get a walk. And it's like, okay. And all the fans are all shaking. And this kid lays down the most professional bunt down the first baseline that you'll ever see. At the first pitch, hits it down the first baseline. He's running as hard as he can down the first baseline. All the, all the infielders came in. Pitcher picks up the ball. He throws it to first. Nobody's there. The first baseman's standing next to him. 
The ball goes to right field. Kid at second base comes around, comes home. Florida wins the World Series. Woo! Give God the glory. Prayer helps, right? Well, let me ask you this. Let's turn to chapter 10 of Acts, verse 34. Keep in mind what I just told you. Now I want you to read this. Now Peter's talking to the Gentiles and he says this. I see very clearly that God shows no favoritism. Hold on a minute, Brad. You just gave us this whole Little League World Series story. And you're telling me now in the word of God, he shows no favoritism. What the heck was going on there? How do you know the Chinese top A wasn't praying? How do you know their family wasn't praying? How do you know what, what, what? How do you know that he didn't choose these guys over there? Was he choosing them because they're Americans? Because they have more money? Because of why? Wait a minute. Something's not adding up here. Are you, are you contradicting yourself? No, I'm not contradicting myself. Let's read the next verse. Chapter, verse 35, it says, In every nation, in every nation, he accepts those who fear him and do what is right. God don't show no favoritism. God wasn't showing no favoritism there. I'm going to show, I'm going to tell you what it was. The miracle wasn't that these kids won the ball game. God, and I'll, I'll argue with anybody and I'll sit here and tell you, I don't think God cares who wins in sports. I could, he could care less who won that World Series. God could care less who wins the, uh, the championship, the World Series for your team and whatever sport it might be. He doesn't care. What God cares about is you, your heart, your attitude, your motives, your willingness to be obedient to his word. And he shows favor to his who show him the love. But I'm going to tell you this. Before you ever accepted Christ, he was showing you favor already. He woke you up that morning. He allowed you to make it to work without getting a crash. He allowed you to live to this day to, for you to sit here right now today. So even when you didn't care about him and you were stomping on him and you were using his name in vain and you were cussing and says, I don't want to have nothing to do with him, he still loved you. And he loves you the same now even though you're accepting him as he did then. It's just a little bit more called favor because you're choosing to accept, be obedient, trust, and love him. And seek him for the way you need to live your life. And not tell him how he's supposed to let you live life. Because too often we want to tell him what to do. How many of us pray and then we tell God, this is what I want, God, A, B, C, and D. And then two weeks later you tell your friend, I didn't get none of it. God didn't answer my prayers. Yeah, he answered your prayer, but you were looking for this prayer and he gave you that one. He threw you the boomerang. Because he's going to give you what he says is best for you, not what you think. Because I don't know about you, in my life, when I start doing what I think, I jack it up bad. And I'm going to say it to you too. You do too. I'm just going to be honest. We all jack it up when we try to do it on our own. But you know what? God wants those who seek him. God is no respecter of persons. He accepts anyone who fears him and works righteousness. Works righteousness. You know, Jesus is the only one that's righteous. None of us are righteous. You have to work righteousness. What does that mean? I'm going to explain it to you in a little bit. God has no favorites. God is not prejudiced against anyone. Oh, now we're starting to talk about some of that stuff and makes you squirm in your seat when you say we're prejudiced. But we all have some prejudices in us. But God doesn't. God accepts everyone as they, how they are. God doesn't accept a person because of their nationality. God doesn't accept a person because of their race, their social standards, or their class. I don't know about you guys, but too many of us Try to run around trying to be high class, high and mighty. We go out and spend money on stuff we ain't, can't even afford and go in debt because we got to look good. You know what? 
God don't care what you look like. God wants to see what your heart looks like. That's high class. That's high and mighty. But don't let it get too high and mighty. I'll get to that in a minute. God does not favor a person because of who they are, what they do, what they have, their possessions or position. You notice I said position. Too many of us think if I get that that promotion, I get this promotion. When I move up the ladder, then I'll be a lot better off and I'll do this and I'll do that and I'll get away with get away with this and get away with that. God's looking at you. God knows your heart. And maybe you're not getting that position because God knows your motives and they ain't right. And you're going to mess up somebody else's life because you're doing things the wrong way. Also, their abilities or their works. Randy just talked about works. Your abilities and your works and their health and their stature. You know, there are some people that look down on others because of their physical nature, their health situation. Whether they're handicapped or not, we have a tendency to want to judge that nowadays. God don't judge that. God can use you in any way, any way, at any time that he wants to use you. You know, it's kind of interesting because it just came to mind. You know, there's a guy that travels the world, has no arms and no legs. And he just preaches the gospel. How many people have looked at him and said he's got limitations? He don't even have arms and legs. He's got a tongue and he's got a heart. And he has a heart for God and he makes a difference. I don't care what your situation is and where you're at in your life right now. If you put God first and you seek him, no matter where you're at or what you're doing, I don't care if you're, if you're living right out of the pit of hell right now, and I don't care if you can't even get out of bed sometimes and you're hurting because I had a tough time getting here today. I just had sciatic going all up and down me today, but you can see I'm moving around pretty good right now. The devil is a lie. You ain't going to stop me from getting up here and delivering God's word. God can overcome. He can do the same for you because guess what? Don't matter if you're a preacher or not. God can use you. He can use you in any way that you allow him to use you as long as you're obedient to what he's calling you to. Let's go to chapter, stay on chapter 10. I'm going to read 36 through 38, and then I'm going to finish up here. It says this, because he just talked about he accepts people and who, do, who fear him and do right. It says, this is the message of good news for the people of Israel that there is peace with God through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. You know what happened throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee, after John began preaching his message of baptism. They're talking about John the Baptist here now. And you know that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit, with power, then... Then just Jesus went around doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. You notice there that, that it, it, it brings out baptism. Last, last Sunday, that, that, that baptismal was full. We had so many people come up here and accept Christ, praise the Lord. They've accepted Christ. They're openly saying, I want to be held accountable. They got baptized. Jesus got baptized, and as soon as he came out, the dove, which is a symbolic of the Holy Spirit, was, was completely on him, and he went out and he started preaching. But he was preaching to the Jewish people, trying to get their heads straight so that they know what's going on. And now he's got Peter talking to the disciples so that they recognize that they are also e equal. Because last week it said that the, the, that the disciples, that the, not the disciples, <laughs> The Gentiles, the Gentiles and the Jews never mixed. How many of us don't mix? I'm standing here and we're a melting pot in here. You want to know why I made you get up and go speak to somebody that you don't know? Because that means you're forced to say hi to somebody that's not like you. That's the only reason I did it. Other than have some people probably get upset with me, but I don't care about that. We have to recognize that just because somebody don't look like you, they don't speak your language, 
They don't act like you. They don't do things the way you do things, that you're good and they're bad. I often thought, why is it that the world has a problem with Jesus Christ and Christians? Why do they have a problem? Why do we have a problem living out a life, a Christian life? Think about it. If you're following Christ and you just have hope in him and you want to be a fraction of what Jesus is, what does that do to you? First of all, you start to change the way you look about at yourself, which is a good light. You start to be kind, which is a good light. You start to eat food without getting indigestion as much because you're not so mean and mad all the time. Because, you know, physical problems create, mental problems create physical problems sometimes, but God can correct all of that too. We have to recognize that through Christ, we have a life. Let that soak in a second. Through Christ, you have a life. What do you mean? I have a life now. Yeah, what kind? What's the quality of your life? Christ will give you a better quality of life and show you the way and how to get through it. You know what? People that are Christians, and what I was getting at just a minute ago was the fact that a lot of people don't go to church. A lot of people don't want to have anything to do with Christ because they look at the Christians and they recognize that we're not doing what we're supposed to do, but yet we're yelling that we're Christians from the rooftop and we're living like hell just like they are. So why should I change? Why should I give up watching football on Sunday mornings and go listen to some preacher preach at me when I can sit here and eat my chips and guacamole and watch the ball games and scream and yell just like they do? But you're cussing and I'm not. doesn't mean you can't do that as a Christian. What it means is, is we need to start living the life. But what is it that we do? Well, the things that are acceptable to God, things that are acceptable to God. Remember I told you that Jesus is the only one righteous. None of us are righteous. We can only earn our righteousness. We can work our righteousness through Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. How do you do that? The people that are acceptable to God are the ones that fear God, that love God, respect God, seek God. People that are working out their righteousness. Righteousness what the Bible, in the Bible, what righteousness means is to be right and to do right. Not according to your standards, but according to God's standards. If you choose to do that and you choose to step out into that, we're not perfect. We never will be, and we will have issues, but God will bring us to where we need to be in his time. Some people, they change overnight. I've seen it. Some people, they change over decades. I've seen it. The key to that is one word. They change when they're seeking God. If you choose not to seek him, you're also saying, God, I know more than you. I'm better off where I am. And if I die, if I go out of this parking lot and a car hits me head on and kills me, then I'll just party in hell. No, you won't. Read the real word. You'll know what it's like there. Live your life for Christ so that you can live eternally. Because you know what? We all live eternally. It just determines whether we live in heaven with God or whether we don't. But we all live eternally. You know what? There are people, and these are Christians that, I, that I'm talking to right now. There are people who... Um, they try to, be, try to be righteous. They try to live out righteous. They try to be right and do the right things, but they're kind of stressing the wrong way. You know, sometimes they're being righteous, but yet they're neglecting righteousness. You know, when you're trying to be righteous and neglect righteousness, what it does is it creates a false security where you start to believe that whatever you choose to do is, is acceptable to God because you believe in Jesus. Well, I believe in Jesus, so I can just do what I want to do. He's going to forgive me anyway. You know, that's, that's, that's trying to be righteous, but it's not righteousness. Because, you, you know, but you neglect doing good things and living like you should. You neglect obeying God, and you also neglect serving others. When you start focusing your life on yourself, 
and just your little nest egg of people? And you, who cares about these people? And who cares about these people? And I ain't worried about them. Then that's, you know, and then you talk about Jesus. Oh, I love Jesus. I love Jesus. But I'm going to segregate myself and do things my way. Then you're not representing who Christ is. And you wonder why people don't want to go to church when they look at you. You know, Randy talked about do they know you when they see you by your action, whether you're Christian or whether you're not. People aren't stupid. They can pick things up, and they can hear you throw a God word out here and God word out there, and then all of a sudden you throw a couple, two, two minutes later you're throwing a few adjectives in front of God's name, and then you're sitting there going, oh, I don't understand. They're just talking about they love God, and they're over here cursing God, and, they, and you expect me to be part of that? I don't think so. That's when you're in that battle of righteousness and trying to be righteous and all of these other things. You know, the other thing that creates false, false security, the other thing that creates problems when you're trying to be righteous, it's a word they call, they just call it loose living. You know the Lord, you've known the Lord, but you go out and live the life that you want to live. Whatever, you don't, you don't worry about it. You just do whatever feels good, whatever's comfortable. And you think that, you think because I, have, I know Jesus that I just do whatever I want to do. It's not acceptable to God. Does he strike you down and kill you because you're starting to sin? No. But then you're out here representing, who Je uh, representing Jesus Christ, and you're living like hell. Doesn't mean that you don't know him. Doesn't mean that you haven't accepted him. But you have to continue to move forward in, G in your righteousness in Jesus. We are not capable, but through Christ we are. We, we are. I don't care how much you know about Christ. I don't care how many scriptures you can quote. It, that righteousness doesn't come but through Jesus and Jesus alone. The last half of that scripture is what Paul, Peter was trying to make sure that the, uh, all those people understood was that it's through Christ and Christ alone. The Jews need to know it's through Jesus. Everybody needs to know it's through Jesus. I don't care where you're from or what you do. You got to recognize it's through Jesus and Jesus alone. But the other way that people like to stress is doing righteousness and neglect being righteous. All right, Pastor, you're starting to confuse me. You're using that righteous word way too much, and it's just got me, my head boggled. Don't worry, I'm going to help you clear that up in a second. But I'm going to help you and direct you how to clear that up. Well, when you're in that position, then self-righteousness and legalism comes into play. Now you start looking at somebody and going, hmm. You know those people in that church, the women, they wear pants. Ooh, they could never see Jesus. Be like when I was at the border one day, some guy came up and I had short pants on driving a truck. He goes, you can't be a pastor. Well, why not? You're wearing short pants. And this is a nice truck. You can't be driving a nice truck. You can't be a preacher. Only preachers can't be doing those things. Legalism. Oh, you can't be a Christian because you didn't get on your knees to pray today. You know what? Praying is just talking to Jesus, having a relationship with him. He says it in his word. But see, we also have a tendency as Christians to look at those people out in the world and say, boy, you need to get saved. You need Jesus. Your life is terrible. All you're doing is judging them. Why don't you go up and show a little bit of love? Love them where they're at and let God do the rest. Well, how do I love them, Pastor? Ask Jesus how to do it, and he'll show you. The Holy Spirit will guide you because everybody loves a little bit different. Everybody's different. You remember I told you everybody's different? You don't see them the same. Our DNA's not the same. It's never going to be the same. So you let the Holy Spirit guide you. That's the only way you're going to figure it out because the way I love somebody might be different. The way she loves them and the way you love them, the way you love them, it's all different. You have to trust the Holy Spirit. So therefore, you might think you're going to do it the, the way that you want to do it. You might try to love them in the way that you think you're going to love them. Next thing you know, they're done. They don't want to have nothing to do with God forever. Guess who's got an answer for that one on Judgment Day? <laughs> they're answering, and you better answer it because it's going to come. We all have to be answering to God at some point in time. Being judgmental is not, bad, not a way to live. It's a bad thing to do. Start looking at the people around you. Start looking at the lives around you. Start seeking Christ and start showing the love of Christ. 
in everyone, no matter who they are, where they're at, what they're doing, what they're not doing, whether you agree or not. Because let me tell you something. You wouldn't be here today if somebody didn't care enough to pray. If God didn't love you where you were at before he brought you to where you are today in his fold. You know, once again, I just want to repeat this. The Bible knows nothing about being acceptable to God without being made righteous in Jesus Christ. Romans 3.10 basically says, no one is righteous. Jesus is the only one that's righteous. Our only righteousness is through Jesus and Jesus alone. Now, I... I I think they gave you a handout today. And that, on that handout, it should, if I don't, I hadn't looked at it, so I'm, if, I, if I misspeak, then contact me and I'll give it to you. But there's a whole bunch of scriptures that were there that will help you to understand what righteousness is all about. And you said, well, why aren't you telling me? Because I don't have all day long and I'm not going to take your whole day. Because whether, whether you realize it or not, I, I like football too. <laughs> but what I am going to tell you is do yourself a favor. Let this be the first step towards your growth in Christ. I don't care what your experience is. I don't care if you believe in him or you don't believe in him. I don't care if you're a pastor or a minister. I don't care where your maturity level is or isn't in Christ. You can always grow. So let's start today. Understanding what righteousness is, look up those scriptures, read the context around it, pray about that, and start living out the kind of righteousness through Jesus Christ through you and live out the kind of righteousness that needs to be for the world to see so that we can begin to change the world, so that we can begin to change our community, our family, our friends, our neighbors, so that we can make a difference. You know, God loves us. God loves you. When I'm done, at the close of service, we're going to have a prayer team that's going to come right up here. And I'm going to challenge you. I know for a fact there's not a single person in here that don't need prayer for something. Don't be shy. Don't let the moment pass you. You can come forward. You can have prayer. And I will promise you, the coffee shop will still be open when you get done with prayer. So you're not going to miss out on that. If your heart's not right, you know it, whether I know it or anybody else knows it. And it doesn't matter who knows it. It's nobody else's business but yours and God's. Because none of us can look down upon you. Nobody cares but God. If you feel the movement of the Holy Spirit from your heart alone, come down and let somebody pray with you. If you feel like that you're one of these people that love the Lord, been living your life for Christ, continue to seek Christ, but you just haven't. Sometimes you just fall away and you just need to, that mm, to get going. Come down and let somebody pray for you. If you're seeking a miracle for somebody else, come down and let get prayer for you. Let me tell you something. Once God's in you, <laughs> life is good. Life is very good. It doesn't matter if you're having a painful day. Life is good. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for your word. I thank you for who you are. I thank you for every single person that came in here today, Lord, to hear your word. And, God, I just ask that you impress on them that life's ready to change doesn't matter how much they love you or where they're at in your life, that you're ready to move them one step farther. So, God, I just ask right now in the name of Jesus that you would touch the hearts of everybody here. Lord, that you will reign in our lives so that your kingdom will be crowded in full. Lord, we love to just see it where it says it's not just a narrow that get through according to your word, that the multitudes continue to flock in. But us at Belong Church will be the example of your son, Jesus. So at least everybody that comes in these doors know that they belong. 
at all times. We love you, Lord. We praise you. We give you the glory in Jesus' name. Amen.